I'd like to talk about the subject of Brexit. I'd like to talk, if I may, and about Greece and the future of the Euro. Uh, first of all, on Brexit. I think the first indication as to whether Britain is leaving or not will probably come to us when we look at the money markets uh, in Asia uh, on the morning or during the night after the vote, because I understand a lot of exit polling has been done privately by money changers in order to change the money at the right time, and they will be trying to take advantage of that private information before the rest of us get full information. So that's, I think, the best thing to be watching if you need to know. If you're waiting for the actual results, it will be uh, not until 3 a.m. in the morning, I think, uh, British time, that you will know what's happening. Let's assume that Britain decides to leave. And I don't think they will, but let's assume that they, they, they do. An incoming government, and I think there will be a new government, I don't see how David Cameron can survive if his authority has been undermined by his advice being rejected in such a major matter by his people. Uh, a new go government can only be formed when a new Conservative leader is elected, and that will take several months. Uh, when that new Conservative leader takes office, he or she will have to decide, I think, between four different options. The first option will be to say, well, look, we're going to take this vote literally. It means leave the European Union. But given our experience over the summer with all the difficulties that that has shown on the markets, we think it's, we shouldn't rush to the door. So we're going to join the European economic area as a temporary expedient at least, which would mean that we continue to have access to the UK, the UK would continue to have access to the EU markets, but would still have to apply EU laws, and our EU is not making all that many laws now anyway, uh, and would still have to make a contribution to the EU budget. That would be the safest option of all and would be relatively not disruptive. The next one would be to apply for a free trade agreement with the European Union, while simultaneously seeking to withdraw from the European Union. And there are two separate processes. Uh, the majority that's required within the European Union to approve a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom is unanimity, whereas leaving the European Union, a withdrawal treaty can be agreed by a majority. So there will be two parallel processes. The difficulty is that the withdrawal treaty is supposed to be concluded within just two years, whereas uh, the experience with trade agreements, even much less complex ones like the Canadian agreement, where the amount of goods and services being exchanged is much fewer, is that they take seven, eight, nine years. And they become hostage to the domestic politics in every one of the EU countries. Uh, there are aspects of the agreement with North America that cannot be finalized yet because one or two countries object to, the, to, to it. That's a free trade option free trade agreement option. The next option is simply leave and continue to trade with the European Union on, as, as a member of the World Trade Organization. A bit of difficulty here is that Britain isn't a member of the World Trade Organization. It's a member of the World Trade Organization through the European Union, but in order to trade as a WTO member outside the European Union, it would have to join the WTO as Britain. And that is an additional complication. Um, the third and the final option that it has is to simply say, we're not going to send in this letter triggering a withdrawal, but we're going to start selectively not implementing certain EU laws. For example, the Working Time Directive. Now, this would pose an immediate challenge to the European Union, because the European Union has no army to enforce its will. Uh, all it has is the European Court of Justice and the possibility of imposing fines on countries which, find, which countries may choose to pay or not. The European Union has no coercive, coercive power. So if Britain decides to break its treaties with the European Union by selectively repealing the bits of the single market package that it doesn't like, then I think the European Union will find itself having to basically 
unilaterally shut down access for British goods and services to the, U to the EU market. Uh, and this would become essentially a trade war between the EU and the UK, if the UK were to choose that fourth option. But as I say, there are four options. We have no idea which will be chosen, and even more so, we have no idea who will be doing the choosing, because we don't know what sort of government Britain will have uh, by this time, by September. What will happen to the European Union? I was interested in that we're only going to see a 0.3% cumulative drop in economic growth as a result of Britain leaving. That's good news. Um, I'm not sure I believe it, but uh, that's what The Economist says. Um, what will the, how will the European Union change? Will there be a big rush towards integration? Now that we've got Britain out of the way, we can go ahead and do all the things we always wanted to do. Not so sure that that's the case, because I don't think there's agreement with the European Union about all the things they always wanted to do. But I think there will be movement towards perhaps a single digital market, movement towards greater mutualization in the area of telecommunications. But basically, we'll have a more cautious, more transactional Europe. We won't have a Europe that's driven by a, a forward-leaning idea. Now, will, can such a union stay together? I don't think it's going to be easy. The European Union only exists because countries are prepared not only to give up sovereignty, but to make sacrifices for others. It only exists because of that greater vision. And that's why I think the British exempting themselves from ever closer union is not a good move at all because it takes away the philosophical and emotional underpinning that keeps the European Union moving forward on the basis of mutual sacrifice for the greater good. And I think it is important to recognize, and I think it will be recognized after two or three years, that the European Union is one of the few methods we have for democratically governing globalization. I don't think that Greece on its own could take on the Google monopoly. I don't think the United Kingdom on its own could take on the Google monopoly. But the European Union, acting for 500 million people and 25% of the world's GDP, does have the capacity to take on the Google monopoly. So if we want democratic control of capitalism, we actually need instruments like the European Union. And this is why I find the arguments about sovereignty that we hear from English people, and it's mainly an English thing rather than a Scottish or a Welsh thing, rather unreal. Is the House of Commons really sovereign in a globalized world where the standards are set elsewhere, where goods and services are coming across the, across, uh, across the phone lines at such speed? Of course not. The UK or any other country is strong only to the extent in the modern world, that it can influence other countries. And withdrawing, I think, reduces influence. I now say a few words about Greece. I think it's important to say, and I speak as an Irish person, that here in Greece you have made fiscal corrections that are twice as great as anything we have had to do in Ireland. It has been an enormous political effort that has been made here in Greece. It's not complete. The pension reform is not complete. Public administrative, the public administration needs to be almost refounded from the beginning on the basis of less political patronage or no political patronage and an independent administration that just does what the politicians decide but does not contain people put there by the politicians. You need judicial reform here in Greece. And you need judicial reform because if you want to get foreign direct investment, People need to know that there's a reliable dispute settlement mechanism. They also need to know who owns particular property. So you need a land registry here in Greece, which is missing. We've had all of those things in Ireland for centuries almost. We inherited them indeed from the British. But Greece has to build those from the ground up. Growth will occur in Greece, but the conditions for growth are that you have a reliable dispute settlement mechanism. You know who owns what piece of property. That you have that sense of security, that the only risks you're taking 
are economic risks, that you're not taking political risks when you invest in Greece. And that's I think, something that has to be dealt with if you're to develop an export sector. And I think the problem that Greece faces at the moment, which Ireland doesn't, didn't face when it entered its crisis, is that we had, thanks to foreign direct investment, a substantial export sector, which had been facilitated by, the, by having those things I mentioned earlier, like a reliable judicial system and so forth. Greece doesn't have those, and to get large amounts of foreign direct investment, particularly, I think, from the Greek community abroad, you are required to make those major reforms. Ten seconds on banking union and the euro. We do need mutual deposit insurance if banking union is to be complete, and we, but we also need government's bonds not to be being, being bought to an excessive degree by the banks in the country that the government is operating in. So we need to find for banks an alternative safe asset to the bonds of their own government. And I think that those two issues go together. Mutual deposit insurance and the creation of a safe asset in which banks can invest. And I will stop at that because I believe I've gone over my time.